Hello and welcome to this video. Yeah, it's been a while since I did some videos in um, one of those series like end game strategy, middle game strategy and so on. But of course, um, those series, they are not dead. <laughs> it's just like there were other things to do. Yeah, I did uh, the World Championship match. I did cover lots of my own games, which is always um, in high demand. People like that. So I do coverage of my own games. It also is something that uh, I must admit is good yeah, for my own chess because I look at my games a little bit more thoroughly then and to present them on the channel is a good thing also for me, yeah, like reviewing my mistakes, things like that. Of course, you also do that on your own when you're not doing a video, but, but still it is a bit gives a little extra incentive to to do things with your own video uh, with your own games okay well back to that on um, serious end game strategy this is part 10 and it's quite funny that in the first nine parts I never had a game of one of the greatest end game strategists of all time of course I'm talking about the Swedish uh, living legend Ulf Andersson who funny enough actually played um, in those in this tournament that I played in the open Bavarian Championships we played um, uh, next to each other two or three times. It's quite it's quite fun. Okay, so let's have a look at this game. This is a game where Anderson played black. It's about endgame strategy, but I'm going to go briefly through the whole game because we relatively quickly reach an endgame, and um, it's um, a good thing to see the development how it came to this endgame. Um, the white player is uh, Rinaldo Vera. He's a grandmaster. Maybe not at the time, in '85, quite quite early. Maybe he was a grandmaster even back then, but decently high rated, about 2,500 at the time. So let's have a look. Wolf, of course, playing black, and um, he was and always still is an excellent strategist and positional player, but he's never really um yeah gone away from playing the sicilian yeah always playing the sicilian as black not all the time he also played uh, his french defenses and so on but he had lots of sharp sicilians as black but here vera played c3 the ala pin and anderson plays with e6 and d5 that's a very solid answer to the c3 sicilian and uh, something that can be recommended if you don't mind French structures. Yeah, of course, white can go e5 for the advanced French, or he can take on d5 as Vera did in the game, after which, well, queen takes d5 is still possible, but e takes d5 is the true French move played by Ulf here. And uh, well, now we got an isolated queen pawn position really quickly after bishop e3. Now Anderson takes on d4. This is actually a move that, that I like a lot. Um, c4 is also an option here, um, after which something like b3 leads to an entirely different pawn formation. But the move here played in the game, the capture, I think is quite interesting. The idea is that after bishop takes, Anderson plays knight c6, knight f3, and now he plays the move a6. That's actually a move that I did not know before looking at this game, but it's, uh, it's very logical. When I played this as black, um, some years ago, I was going for this actually, taking, knight takes, maybe queen takes is worth considering, and then bishop c5, the idea being that after this check, I went king f8, that's cool, funny, funny line, but uh, it is quite decent, black is playing knight f6, g6, and king g7, which um, is a good formation on the king side, and often the bishop on b5 is not so well placed after queen b6, very often there is a tempo loss involved on this bishop. So maybe some interesting um, hints here about the opening, but okay, the opening is not the main feature of this game. Anderson didn't take, he played the move a6. The idea is that after this he took and then played knight f6 and bishop c5 without having to worry about a check on b5, so good stuff. Now knight f1, yeah, why takes lots of time to regroup his knight? Yeah, knight to e3, rook e8, castles, queen b6. Yeah, I'm not sure about this knight maneuver. Yeah, it, it puts some pressure on d5, but it is never really enough to trouble black on this pawn. On the other hand, black has two bishops and an active rook, an active queen. So 
the the main thing that you need to um, look for when you have an isolated queen pawn is definitely their activity. Yeah, black has active pieces. Rook b1, not a happy move, but b2 was hanging, and it there wasn't really a great alternative. Bishop to d7, just developing. Bishop f3 and bishop c6. Yeah, black is covering the pawn and prepares further centralization. However, now white went with b4, a very um, direct move, challenging the c5 bishop. Yeah, what should black do now? Yeah, black can retreat and uh, preserve his uh, bishop, or he can take on d4. And what is very remarkable is that now Anderson takes on d4. I don't think that bishop f8 would have been that terrible, by the way, but uh, the capture is just a good move, probably the better move, but well, the alternative was not leading to, to trouble or anything. The remarkable thing is the following. Black took, queen takes, queen takes, c takes, d4. Yeah, very interesting. So it's a quite simplified position. And um, at first, you might think, okay, isn't this a little bit better for white, maybe? Yeah, why, why could this be better for white? Yeah, white has two pieces attacking the pawn. And it looks like it's only passively defended, which is in some way true. The knight and bishop, they both cover this pawn. So is this a classic case of a bad bishop versus a good bishop situation? Well, almost. There are some subtle differences in, uh, in this um, position. Um, or some differences is wrong, some subtle nuances in this position that have to be um, considered. It is in fact a, a very important point that white has played the move b2, b4. If, it, um, if this um, wouldn't have happened, I mean, this is a theoretical discussion now in a way, because b4 initiated the structure with bishop takes and the trades on d4, but the main point is that white's queen side is weakened. Those squares here are weak, c4, b5, a4, and there are potential invasion squares for black's pieces. On the other hand, it's not so easy for white to imagine how to invade on the c-file or on the e-file, especially in view of black's coming maneuver. Black plays g6, and it should be really viewed in connection to this maneuver, g6. Yeah, this is an important move. It takes away the f5 square from the knight. It puts yet another pawn on light squares. Note that black has all pawns on light squares with his bishop being on a light square as well. This is something that normally shouldn't be done. But we have a case here where this is not really an issue. And this is because this is not a totally closed position where this bishop on c6 is just, let's say, uh, incarcerated by his own pawns. That's not the case. The bishop here all the time has this option, for example, to activate or via b5, b5, d3, those kind of things. So it's uh, not, it shouldn't be viewed as totally dogmatic that pawns should be on the other color, not the color of the bishop, but on the other color. In some cases, it's not really, not really a problem to have those pawns on the squares that your bishop is on. In fact, sometimes it's a case, and I had this in numerous games um, in um, over the board and blitz chess, sometimes you even have the case that, in fact, those pawns that are on dark squares, they cannot be protected by the bishop. Yeah, White's bishop cannot protect the pawns on d4 and b4, and therefore they tend to be weak, while the somewhat, yeah, badly placed pawns are securely defended by the bishop. This is a very uh, interesting phenomenon sometimes in chess that this um, this is funny um, funny quote by Romanian Grandmaster Shuba. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's S-U-B-A Zuba <laughs> or Shuba. I, I don't know exactly how he is pronounced, but he has this famous quote like bet um, bad bishops protect good pawns. And there is, this is a really a funny quote, but there are cases really where the optically, like on the surface, bad looking bishop is not, not really a problem. And here there is uh, one of those cases. One key point is the following. White now played g3, 
yeah, a useful a useful move that I mean maybe this is an idea yeah, regrouping the knight or even gaining a little bit of uh, space here on the king side. It's maybe questionable if this was necessary, but it's a kind of a routine move that very often is played. And now what black is doing is very instructive. Black in fact has um, has his pieces on good squares. The only thing that you can argue about is the rook on a8. Everything else is like well placed. The knight on f6 and the bishop they're doing their respective jobs. So what should black do? Well in the end game you need the king and black is doing that immediately. King f8, rook c1, looks normal, and king e7 heading for d6. Yeah, this is really very instructive. Before everything else, black is activating the king. And once the king arrives on d6, it accomplishes two very important things. It covers the d5 pawn, which is super important. It lends cover to this pawn a second time, or here even a third time, so that one of the minor pieces, and this will be especially the bishop, is free to maneuver. Yeah, it sort of um, helps to activate the other pieces. Yeah, with the king being a defender of the pawn, you can use the bishop actively. For instance, here or somewhere else. The king on d6 also, we can uh, put this on the board, white plate a4, relying on the little tactic. My tactic is a strong word for that, that you regain the pawn here. After this, Anderson just played king d6. We can uh, look at this really on the board. Now the king is ideally placed. Note that with g6 he had prepared this. Yeah, This was a, a d plan. The king on d6 also covers those crucial squares where there are potential, there's potential for a white rook entering the position. This is really an ideal setup from black's point of view. You're covering things and um, also freeing your pieces for activity like the bishop on c6. White now played rook a1. Yeah, now a4 was, was hanging yeah, as d5 was protected. Uh, and rook c8. a4 may be slightly questionable, but it's not, it's not nothing bad is happening to white yet. He went a5, uh, fixing pawns on the light squares. Knight e4, centralizing this knight. Rook c2. Bishop d7, yeah, all very logical. With bishop d7, black um, intends to um, yeah, activate uh, this piece and maybe trade one pair of rooks. This um, can, be a, can be a useful device here to make uh, some progress. Here we come to an interesting point. Um, in the game, white took the knight on e4, which is a very tempting move to play because quite often, if you um, believe that you have the better minor piece, I mean, to put it um, in concrete words, if you think that the opponent has a bad bishop, you very often want a knight against the bad bishop because the knight often is the, the better piece in those close type of position. Here, however, after bishop takes e4, it's not really a close position. There's an enc file open. So bishop takes e4 is questionable in this position and sort of leads to the difficulties that, that white is going to experience. Black already is a little bit more comfortable with this king on d6. He's more active with his, with his pieces. But if white now finds the best move, he's still very much um, in the game and has a balanced position. Um, what is white's best move here? Maybe treat it as a little exercise. If white plays the best move here, he's still okay. I'll be silent for a couple of seconds and then I'll tell you the move. Yeah. Use that to, to drink something. Yeah, white now has an excellent move to keep the balance. And this is a very strong move, rook to c5. It's very strong. It activates this rook, attacking d5. And well, of course, it's not blundering in exchange. If black takes it, white will recapture with the b-pawn, with check. Very nice now. And <laughs> where should play go? It's not so easy. If you um, go to c7, for example, you run into checks. And this is a very nice way to, to continue. Yeah, like rook c7. Knight here, 
and uh, this is a funny, funny draw. Um, and black really is in no position to to play for a win here. Yeah? It's um, it's exceptionally problematic to to continue this now. Let's say um, after knight d5, do you want to go somewhere else? Yeah, okay. It's actually if you go to c8, there is um, yeah amongst others there's still knight b6. Yeah, <laughs> knight b6. I mean this is uh, this is a very uh, risky decision trying to trying to continue here. Yeah, moves like let's say rook b1 or knight d7 and c6. They are very problematic. It's um, not a good idea really to try to continue here. Rook c5 was a great defensive resource that however wasn't played by the white player. He took on e4. It's not impossible that he thought um, he's maybe playing for an advantage. I mean, it's, it's possible. But this is really, really not the case. Rook takes e4. Rook c8, bishop c8. Yeah, and now we see another problem. As I mentioned, these kind of these pawns they are vulnerable, well, attacked by the rook. So white has to now take up a defensive um, post with this rook. Yeah, a move like let's say um, knight c2 is not leading to much. Yeah? Black can just enter with the rook, and this is going to be problematic. Note that. Yeah. Those entry squares are covered by the king, but the white king is still on g1. So this is a huge difference um, if you compare both uh, both camps. Yeah, rook d1 is stronger. And it's not like white is in, in, in super big trouble. He can still put up a great defense, but it, it gets difficult. Bishop d7, yeah, eyeing this, this square for activation. Or b5, yeah, both are, are good ways to activate the bishop. Rook d2. Yeah, getting out of a possible tempo with bishop a4. Yeah, and now a key position. How does black continue? Yeah, you need to to make progress. It's all good and all nice, but how how are you going to progress? There are three basic ideas that black can go for. He can activate his the pieces um, like this, for example. Or uh, I didn't do that. What was that? <laughs> um, or he can uh, play bishop a4, yeah, trying to activate his bishop. Another plan is, this has to be timed correctly, of course, is the invasion, hmm, I'm painting this arrows all wrong, it's the invasion of the king. As I mentioned, there are light squared weaknesses with b4 and a5. This um, is a big difference to, let's say, if the pawns now, if white pawns were on a2 and b2, for example, um, I'd rather be white in this position. <laughs> it's nothing great, yeah. It's not like white is uh, hugely better or anything, but it's a huge difference as those pawns, if they were here, they really, uh, yeah, they, they, they weren't, there won't be a weakness on the queen side then, and there's really not much to play for. Yeah, it's, it's equal, yeah. I'd rather be white is uh, just my nat natural optimism, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's nothing for white, it's, it's just equal. But this way, with those weaknesses, black is uh, definitely calling the shots. The third plan, and the one played by Anderson first, is the move, I think it's the strongest, f5. Yeah, Gaining space. Black is intending to push f4 or g5 and f4, gaining further space or weakening the position of white even further. White now has to react. He has to yeah, set up the position for a capture on f4. I play king g2 here. Yeah? And then f4 happened. Or he has to um, to cover f4. For example, knight g2 was an idea. In fact, this was the move I, I actually expected uh, to, to, to be played. But it's not um, giving white yeah, huge relief as well. Um, black, for example, is also g5. But he can also play this move, which is quite interesting. The idea is that black is intending to switch his attention to the c file or to c3, both are very worthwhile. The one point is that if now white tries bishop um, a rook c2 to cover the c file, then black has bishop a4. And we see the benefits of having a long range piece like the bishop. This is just attacked and the rook has to do both jobs now, defending e2 and defending the c file. 
And I cannot do both. Yeah, something like rook c3 now is answered by invasion, like on e2 or e4, maybe even e4. Yeah, something like that, for example. And now note that here, white is in huge trouble. Something like the the trade, for example, loses like immediately, yeah, because black will invade with the king. The king position on d6 is just fantastic. It's good for defense covering the seventh rank, covering E and C file, but also it's active, going to those weak pawns on the queen side. Black has a clear invasion route. So um, this move knight g2 wouldn't have saved white as well. Um, well this is too strong. I mean, in, in fact, I think what he did was better, but knight g2 is, is not helping at all. He went king g2, f4 knight d1 this is a tougher defense it looks a bit passive but the knight is coming to c3 so it does have an idea rook e1 f3 and now a new um idea is introduced in the position or well not introduced it is executed black is entering with the bishop bishop a4 with a tempo on the knight very important knight c3 and bishop to b3 yeah, note that the bishop will find an excellent post on c4. It's just more active there than on d7. It covers the d5 pawn, potentially covers a6 in some situations. Yeah, if like let's say b5 is happening sometime. It's just probably the best possible position for this bishop on the board. And it clearly shows that a bad bishop, in terms of purely looking at the color complexes, a light squared bishop when all pawns are on light squares is not necessarily a bad piece because if it gets out of the pawn chain and here there never was a closed pawn chain anyway if it gets out of the pawn chain it would be a very active piece that really i mean it, it just looks right into white's position and even um yeah is helping to dominate the knight here in this position I think White uh, missed a chance to defend um, to defend much better. Um, maybe if you if you have a look at this position and uh, treat this as a little exercise, what is the the best way for White to continue to defend here? I'll give you a little time to pause the video. It is not trivial. Take a little bit of time. It's a good exercise in defense. Yeah, I think the the best defense here. I can tell you what you played, but I can start with that. White played the move um, rook b2, which is really not doing that much, as um, black is playing bishop c4 anyway. Um, but he had a good chance here to um, to activate his position. I think he should have played the move g4 here. The idea is that white wants to go here, king g3. And then rook to h2, activating the rook against the h7 pawn. This is the only weakness, in a way, that white can attack in black's position. And he should definitely try try to do that. Um, it's not, um, I don't, I didn't do a an, an really um, exhaustive analysis here. I just want to show you some key points. Let's say bishop c4, that's uh, the logical move, king g3. And black, let's say, plays king to c6 trying to prepare this invasion route yeah once the knight is go going away from c3 which can easily happen black just has to attack it yeah in some way and then we are ready to enter with the king yeah and now rook h2 going for counterplay rook e3 knight a4 king b5 knight c5 king b4 rook h7 King c3, knight b7, king d4, rook g7. It's just this is just a sample line to illustrate what uh, my point is. White is getting some activity with this rook, and um, there are chances to to trade off more pawns. I still think that black is definitely better here with the d pawn and the better minor piece, but it's nothing that will be be lost like quickly. Uh, the computer, in fact, only gives black a very slight advantage. Where I'm a little bit in doubt if he would keep this um, uh, evaluation if you let it calculate for a long time. I only 
checked it for like a minute or something. Yeah? Because uh, my hunch is that the d pawn in combination with the bishop is just very strong. But still, it's, it's a fight. In the game, however, um, you see um, that white position is going downhill really, really quickly. Instead of, uh, if we jump back, of this g4 move with this activation, he went rook b2, as mentioned, and then bishop c4. And now we are approaching uh, something like, I mean, it's not a Zugzwang, but it's close. <laughs> White really has problems to move his pieces. And um, if this knight is uh, at some point dislodged from the square, there is this um, additional thing happening with the king invading. It's now going down, as mentioned, really quickly. White played rook b1, rook e3, and now it is really tricky. Yeah? If you want to move the knight, there's only a4, and this uh, also doesn't help that much, like knight a4, give this check, king to h3, where else? And now we have this situation. The knight is looking nice, but it's not doing very much. And this is just a weak pawn. If this is defended, black is going to invade even further. Yeah, it's really funny that the light squares are so weak on the white side. And uh, the bishop is not a problem at all. It's just a better piece, yeah, than the, than the knight. Yeah, knight a4 didn't look great, so he went rook c1. But now, this is a simple move, rook d3. And hmm, that's it. This pawn is gone. Knight a4 was played, rook d4, knight c5, and we actually arrived to the, at the same position that I showed before, almost the same position. Rook e1 and rook e2, this was move 40, and here the white player resigned, probably after the time control was completed. Yeah, this is now a very easy win for black. You have the extra d pawn that will just... Uh, yeah, move forward and additionally you can always pick up the whole queen side with the king. That's actually a very nice example of um, an, an undogmatic approach to pawn structure related to the bishop. Yeah, here Anderson really didn't mind to put all his pawns on light squares. It wasn't a problem at all that those uh, pawns um, were vulnerable or or subject to an attack. In fact, due to Black's better activity, yeah, the active rook here, and the ideas to invade with the bishop on those those roots here, it wasn't a problem at all that he had the pawns on the light squares. In fact, um, the light squares on the white side really were weak. A key point was that white had advanced his queen side pawns that far up the board so that there actually were weaknesses that the black king actually and at the end um, really in, in the game used to invade. So a very nice example that shows sometimes it's not that big a deal if you put the pawns on the color complex of the bishop that you have. It depends on the activity of the bishop. Can it be activated to actually enter the opponent's camp? And the piece activity, all other pieces, this is very important um, to um, get a complete picture about the position. It's rarely about the bishop and the, the color of the pawns alone. It's also about what can you do with your pieces, what can you attack, and what are the weaknesses in the opponent's position. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. It was a really nice example of um, great endgame play. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.